The Dickheads are presented in color. BKD Heads podcast is starting to record. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Hey, Dickheads, like a pink laser beam of truth beaming straight from mostly California, but all over the country to your brain hole. Today is a special Spin Ratters edition. Uh, our third Norman Spin Rad episode, if you include the interview we did with him. And we're very excited to talk about, maybe uh, excited to talk about his 1972 meta satire weirdness, The Iron Dream. Um, but... Uh, let's go start by introducing ourselves and telling people who we are what, and what we do. Um, Dave Woken, up in the corner, can you start us off? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure how much you want to hear about me, but i um, an old friend of Dave Agronoff's, uh, but I'm a librarian in Chicago. I work for the University of Chicago, um, and I actually focus more on social serving social science and humanities research. Um, I'm a Latin American and Caribbean studies librarian is the term. So my job is making sure the University of Chicago has all the materials they need from uh, access to everything they need from Latin America for their scholars who study that region of the world. Um, but I'm also a longtime fan of science fiction. And before I became a librarian, I was a historian of radical social movements and labor movements. Um, so this book between the, the sort of counterfactuals about fascism and uh, being science fiction from the early 70s actually does tick a lot of boxes for me, even if it's not anything that I work with professionally in my life. Right. And uh, also a uh, longtime punk rocker, record nerd, and... Um, sure. Uh, yeah, record collector. So, um, yeah, and an, old, and an old friend of mine. Um, Below him, uh, if you're watching the video, is Anthony Trevino. Most of you know Anthony because he is one of our regular hosts of the Dickheads podcast. Anthony, it's true. You uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's pretty much, pretty much covers it. I'm Anthony Trevino. I am one of the co-hosts of the Dickheads podcast, as David already said. Sometimes film critic and um, occasional author of bizarre fiction. And uh, although your screen says Charles Nelson, we have his spouse, Mark Conlon. Um, Mark, you are returning to the Dickheads for, you are our most prolific guest outside of the three hosts. Um, I believe this is, including unreleased episodes, your fifth or sixth time being on Dickheads. But this show is your fault uh, because you really wanted to do this one. Um, tell everybody who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Mark Gabrish Conlon. I'm the former editor publisher of Zenger's News Magazine, which is how I met David. He was involved in several political actions in the early 2000s that I was writing about. And uh, I was, um, earlier today, I was listening to Charles Ives' Symphony Number no. 4, which, if there is such a thing as punk rock classical, that's it. So uh, <laughs> I highly recommend that to all the punk fans in the audience. And um, I first heard of The Iron Dream in 1971 when I saw a videotaped interview with Norman Spinrad. He had already written the book, but it had not been published. And he was saying that he had just done this uh, book in which he was attempting to satirize and expose the fascistic tendencies in sword and sorcery novels in general and The Lord of the Rings in particular, and he had called it The Iron Dream, and its centerpiece was a book within the book, a science fiction fantasy uh, sword and sorcery novel written by Adolf Hitler called The Lord of the Swastika. Well, and for those, for those who haven't read The Iron Dream, uh, the bulk of the book is taken up by the text of The Lord of the Swastika. There is an afterword that Spinrad wrote in the persona of a New York University professor named Homer Whipple commenting on it. And as you might have guessed, he deliberately picked The Lord of the Swastika as uh, his title uh, for um, its obvious similarity to The Lord of the Rings. Right. Well, and um, 
we're going to get deeper into like the ins and outs of the book here in a little bit, but um, yeah, way to, to, uh, to really um, bring it in that you were onto this book before most of us were even born. But uh, <laughs> that's scary. Yeah, you. Um, yeah, you, it's like a um, somebody saying, "I've been listening to that band since the demo." Um, <laughs> but, uh, we uh, have talked about the Iron Dream many times on the podcast, just bringing it up uh, for one reason or another. So um, it was kind of inevitable that we were going to do it. But Mark was definitely the one that was pushing me. Um, to make sure that it happened. And Anthony's been on a bit of a spin rad kick um, uh, recently too, just kind of getting into his stuff. And, and we are huge spin rad fans around here. So we definitely wanted to give this, this book some attention. Um, and we're going to do more spin rad books in the future, I'm sure. Um, and hopefully ones that are a little um, less intentionally shitty. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, the publication history of this book is, um, I don't have, it's funny because I'm so used to researching, um, PKD and we have so many details on when this edition came out and that edition came out. Um, we do know, and I do want to give a shout out to, uh, my late friend, uh, Robert Garfat, who was, um, an anarchist bookseller from Victoria, BC who owned uh, Dark Horse Books in Victoria, who passed away last year. He sent me his copy of the first edition of The Iron Dream um, right before he passed away. Um, so he's the reason why I have the first edition, which I did not read this edition because I want to keep it in, in excellent condition. Um, but uh, So I wanted to give a shout out to Robert, who uh, was just a really awesome person and um, uh, really was looking forward to us doing this episode and I'm sorry that he didn't get a chance to hear it. So, um, but I did, I personally read the rediscovery edition, um, which I, uh, bought recently here in town. Um, and this is, so there, the, the Avon edition, for those of you who are watching on YouTube is a really cool cover with, that looks more like it's straight out of the book. And, um, does not have Hitler on the cover. <laughs> and a Avon um, gave uh, Spinrad a very heavy advance for this book, which is interesting to me because um, it it's such a um, controversial and weird book that um, I'm surprised that Avon was willing to shell out um, a lot of money for it, but they did at, for, at, the, at the time. But um, they also requested 10,000 extra words um, after he turned in his first edition because they, because they were going to uh, charge 95 whole cents um, on the cover. And so they said to, uh, to justify that huge price, we need 10,000 more <laughs> words, apparently, in 1972. Um, I think we could all agree that this book did not need 10,000 more words at any time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, The Lord of the Swastika is the book inside of the book, and I want to kind of follow the format that we uh, did on our Hugo episodes, and because um, in this counterfactual history of the Iron Dream, supposedly The Lord of the Swastika won a posthumous um, Hugo Award for Best Novel. And there, it was no um, accident that Spinrad chose the year of 1954 because there was there was some reason why Worldcon did not happen in 1954 and there was no award given that year. So he, it was a way for him to not kind of insult like the people who actually won the award in that year by saying that Hitler wrote a better book than that in this alternate history. But, uh, but keep in mind that if this history happened, science fiction as we know would have been completely different because it would have been a, in a non-World War II world. Um, but uh, eventually in 2004, the 1954 Hugos were given um, um, later, and the books that were nominated from that year were pretty good. 
All right, so yeah, so 1954, um, a pretty big deal. I mean, we got Fahrenheit 451, Caves of Steel, and More Than Human. So I don't think, um, in comparison to the sci-fi of the era, that uh, The Lord of the Swastika uh, really holds up with some of the really good stuff that was happening, at least in our universe at that time. However, um, yeah. Just because the... Hugo voters of 2004 would have thought Fahrenheit 451 was the best sci-fi novel of the of mm -hmm. years previously. Does not necessarily mean that the Hugo voters of 1954 would have. That's true. And um, the the thing to keep in mind is is that the Lord of Swa the Lord of the Swastika was released in a world that had no World War II, and and um, World War II definitely loomed heavy over all of society, not just the science fiction of the era, but it's, it's hard to imagine what the fictional world would be like, um, uh, in, in, in a world without world war II. Um, of course that is part of the job, uh, for Homer Whipple, uh, but we'll get to that eventually. Um, so, uh, much like, um, uh, our man, Philip K. Dick, uh, Spinrad and Philip K. Dick really did like to play with experimental form within the genre, and uh, they were also friends. And I found this amazing quote from Philip K. Dick about, that includes uh, Spinrad. Uh, Anthony, would you like to uh, read this quote from Philip K. Dick? I would love to, except I don't have your notes still. Oh, man, I think I just, hold on, let me pause. Spinrad. That's one of the big key points. That Spinrad, okay, Spinrad in his Whipple persona outlines the counterfactual history, which he doesn't do in the main part of the book, uh, of how the world would have been different if Hitler had not stayed in Germany, not led the Nazi party to a total takeover, not become dictator of Germany, and not started World War II and the Holocaust, and... Uh, Spinrad, as Whipple is saying, that if all those things hadn't happened, the world might even have been worse because there would have been no opposition to the greater Soviet Union taking over all of Europe and uh, most of the world except for the U.S., Japan, and Latin America. And he's also painting a somewhat backhanded compliment to the Japanese, saying that the, you know, the samurai code gave them uh, a strength and power to resist the greater Soviet Union that the United States did not have, even though we were a much larger and richer country. So what Spinrad is basically saying is here is, as bad as Hitler was, and you've just suffered through 220 plus pages of me assuming Hitler's persona to tell you how bad he was, uh, the world without Hitler would even have been worse. Yeah, which... Um is a controversial point um, and is one of the things that is, is uh, very uh, uh, intensive of a point that Spinrad is making. I think um, some of the other things about this history, this, um, this idea that he would be trying to escape communism and that, um, you, you know, the anti-communism of, of, um, of Hitler is very apparent in the actual text of Lord of the Swastika that there's lots of, um, of aspects of the different cultures that the, that Jaeger and, and the other people are fighting that, that represent that. But we're still, we're, st we're still sticking to this fake history. Um, I think the idea of, of the fake history is we've seen it with, Man in the High Castle, we've seen it with the plot against America, is that there's all kinds of different alternative ways to look at how this massive thing in our history, World War II, could have gone, up, gone over and, and gone differently. And I think the starting point of Hitler immigrating to the U.S. and, and being a sci-fi writer is, is, is so interesting. And I, so I think, you know, those aspects of the history, um, elements of it is, is, is really cool. Um, but what's funny is this, this novel is considered an alternate history novel when almost all of the alternate history is in the last four pages. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Honestly, I, I kind of almost feel like that alternate history is one of the weakest parts of considering the larger point he's making and the bulk of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it's, on one level, I can see the need both because, I mean, like, his it stated that he wanted to be as explicit as possible that, you know, this is supposed to be an example of crappy pulp writing uh, in the service of racist fascism. But, um, and so he just explicitly says it in the last four pages. Um, but also as a kind of justification. So like, okay, how did, how would Hitler have written this or whatever? And that's all fine, but I actually don't, like, if you're looking at this as a book that is ultimately a satire of the fascistic elements of science fiction and fantasy, that counterfactual history is kind of the weak point Yeah. to me. I mean, it's, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to have it in, but it is a little bit loose and it would have been more interesting to see the actual novel of that history than the four pages that just sort of throws it in passing right yeah in fact, gonna... yeah if i can step in i think uh one of the uh things that um struck me when i first read it and uh, again this time is that it's really not a counterfactual history novel it is a satire of sword and sorcery uh attributing the fascist elements to it to the most famous fascist of all time and the afterword seems, in part at least, to answer the question readers would be having, well, if this, ha if this had been Hitler's life, how would the world have been different? Mm -hmm. That was not something that Spinrad seemed all that interested in. His main agenda was satirizing what he saw the fascist tendencies of a lot of science fiction, and particularly sword and sorcery, uh, what he later came to, be, to call the emperor of everything. Yeah. I, I do believe that Spinrad had wanted to just do the Lord of the Swastika to begin with um, and to just put it out there. And I, I believe it was either Moorcock or his agent was like, dude, you can't, you, you can't do that. <laughs> 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 you need to put this out of factual history. And, um, and we've seen recently in on our can cancel culture episode, we talked a lot about the fact that you know, Spinrad has um, kind of stepped into it recently with some of the younger generation of science fiction writers, and it was really painful for me to watch that some of the younger science fiction writers who had no idea who Norman Spinrad was, um, he recently wrote, wrote an essay um, critiquing how there was more fantasy novels nominated for the Nebula Award than actual science fiction in this year, and some of the younger writers just... Um, went after Norman Spinrad as this old guy, get off my lawn dude, who they knew nothing about, right? None of these young writers knew who Norman Spinrad was and didn't know that he was an, an anarchist or a progressive. And like watching the reaction to it, I wanted to be like, you have no idea who you're talking to, <laughs> right? You know, and... Mm -hmm they took it as that this old guy was saying that I don't want your diversity, but he, was, he wasn't saying I don't want your diversity. He was saying, I just, I want science fiction, you know? And so. I can think of another, yeah, I can think of another example of that, that in the night in 1969, uh, S.I. Hayakawa, the right wing president of San Francisco state university decided to, uh, as one of his weapons against the Black Student Union strike to bring Duke Ellington and his band for a concert at San Francisco State. And um, Ellington got all these Black militants in his face in 1969 saying that he was being a, you know, a race traitor and he wasn't, uh, you know, standing up for the demands of the Black community. This was the man who had, in the 40s, written the African-American symphony, Black, Brown, and Beige. He'd done a musical called Jump for Joy, which was his attempt to blow out of the water all the stereotypes of black people in popular entertainment. And this guy is getting lectured by the younger generation, weren't even born when those things happened, and being said, well, you're not, you're stand, not standing up enough for um, yourself as a black man and for us as a black community. So that's, uh, <laughs> things like that just happen, uh, you know. Yeah. Well, a lot of young people say a lot of stupid things because they're not aware of the history. Right. And I guess knowing who Spinrad is and what he stands for is really important going into this novel <laughs> um, to see 
you know, what he's doing. Um, I think, you know, Spinrad considers himself an anarcho cynicalist. Um, uh, Dave, maybe you could under, uh, explain better than me, like what the beliefs of, of cynicalism is specifically. Sure. Um, so, so our listeners get an idea for that. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a left wing radical revolutionary left wing ideology. Um, and it kind of grew out of the, the, radical labor movements of the late 19th and especially early 20th century. Um, and so basically like the anarcho-syndicalist idea is that by having all workers organized, that they would be able to resist the powers of both capital and the state and essentially overthrow it and replace it um, with directly democratic communities sort of organized around the production and distribution of their goods, like controlled by the workers themselves. Um, so like probably the, I mean, for people who listen to this podcast, the, the world in Aris and the, the dispossessed is an anarcho-syndicalist post-revolutionary society, right? Um, that's, and in fact, one that a lot of anarchists really like, um, uh, because of the way it's portrayed as like being sort of a, a good example of how that might actually look. Um, historically, probably the most famous example in the U.S., although it actually differs a lot from anarcho-syndicalism, but um, if you know the history of the industrial workers of the world or the Wobblies, who were sort of the radical revolutionary left-wing union movement in the early 20th century, um, opposing the American Federation of Labor, um, they're also very close to, like, anarcho-syndicalism. In fact, like, anarcho-syndicalists are who I studied in the dissertation I didn't finish, so that's mm -hmm. something. Um, but it, interestingly, also... I mean, so it's basically the call for anarcho-syndicalists is that you organize on the ground and confront capital in the state through direct action. You don't elect people to office. You don't, you know, work through and try to pass laws. It's about when all the workers are organized, they can make the machine stop, right? <clears throat> um, you know, sort of your classic left-wing understanding of power, right, that uh, the workers create wealth and that should they work together, they can overthrow their bosses, the state, everything else, and run things for themselves. Um, it's a, the comp history gets very complicated, though, because like some syndicalist thinkers and leaders actually became fascists later, which is a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, just to tie it in with this novel, which might also be why Spinrad sort of saw the danger so clearly, um, because it's a known thing among those who study like anarchist theory that how many folks, you know, Georges Sorel is the most famous syndicalist theorist, uh, French author, and he became a fascist. And his ideas about sort of using a mobilizing myth to unify people were, well, it was a, something in particular Mussolini thought was really powerful and sort of seized upon. So, Well, and Spinrad has specifically said that two books where he explored the ideas of syndicalism and anarchism um, are The Void Captain's Tale and Child of Fortune. Um, mm -hmm. I have not read Child of Fortune. I've read The Void's Captain's Tale. It's a really good space opera, but um, and it's um, a multi. If my memory serves, it's a multi-planetary um, anarchist system. And uh, but they also that book also has a starship that's um, warp drive is basically powered by orgasms. So it's a really interesting book. <laughs> I mean, I will say also historically anarcho-syndicalism was very close to like bohemian free love communities and things like that. I mean, you know, so Emma Goldman, famous for famous American anarchist, ag Ameri actually Russian, but famous for her work in America, agitator, thinker, organizer. She was very close to syndicalist circles and was also big on, you know, free love, on birth control, all these kind of things. So that kind of, that's not unusual <laughs> to me. But if you have like a, a sci-fi writer who's influenced by anarchism in the 60s, they come up with the idea of a ship powered by orgasms. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, and that's, I read that book when I first discovered Spinrad, um, uh, probably 2003. Um, and um, I first discovered Spinrad from friend of the show, Cody Goodfellow, um, telling me, what, you've never read Spinrad? You've got to read Men in the Jungle. And um, which uh, Men in the Jungle is a great Vietnam allegory. Um, the way I always explain Men in the Jungle is it was written the same year that Star Trek premiered and the villain eats babies. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. And I should note 
well, mentioning Star Trek, that Norman Spinrad actually wrote an episode of the original Star Trek, um, which is actually a really great episode, The Doomsday Machine, that's about a doomsday weapon that just basically is left to wander around space eating planets. <laughs> and that it's forgotten about and it's just going around eating planets, which is a really cool concept that Norman Spinrad was able to get into Star Trek. Um, and so I just wanted to throw that out there. But um, so, yeah, let's get into the actual book. Um, Anthony, um, I know um, I thought a lot about this book in, in the sense of when I was reading it, um, it took me a while to get in the headspace of this book was written to be intentionally shitty, which is interesting, but I kept wanting to, I, I kept thinking, well, maybe if, if they weaved in like Hitler's life coming in, in between parts of it, that it would make the book more interesting and perhaps it would, but it would probably take away from the point. Um, that Spinrad was trying to make. How did you feel about reading this, this, the experience of reading this book? I think it would have been better done as a novella instead of an entire novel. Yeah. Um, I, I, and, and I should be upfront about this, that perhaps the fact that I lack an education in Hitler history or just a lot of World War II history in general, I have a very basic knowledge of it. So I think some stuff did probably go over my head in a lot of ways too, which made it a little less enjoyable for me to read a book where I'm like, I feel like I should understand more of what's happening, but I don't. Um, so I, again, I think it's too long. And for somebody who already doesn't like sword and sorcery novels, it, the satire is a little lost on me and I probably could have stuck with it better if it were a novella. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I My initial thought was um, that, and, and I think Le Guin talked about this in her, her review of it, that a uh, short story may have been um, uh, a better way to go with this. However, um, he's, you know, satirizing like a three-book series, you know, so I, I don't know, the, no, the novel form maybe works best. Overall, um, but you could satirize something like a, a Solomon Kane or a, a, some other sword and sorcery character, and not and not just a Lord of the Rings trilogy. You could do that in a short story or a novella and get the same effect. I feel like a short story more written like the Afterword, for example, that kind of mixes the history and a critical review of it probably would have worked um and would have been more digestible but i don't necessarily think that spinrad is always looking for what's the most digestible yeah and and just because that this book didn't necessarily work for me on that level doesn't mean it won't doesn't and hasn't worked for other people yeah um uh dave you wanted to talk about uh the idea of it being intentionally written to be shitty and the purple yeah print. yeah well and not just that i mean it's interesting well, there's that i mean in, in and so I think part of the, well, I guess of the big picture, um, I find that to be, in my experience, to be an incredibly dangerous thing to do in satire that happens very often. Um, I can think in particular of like, you know, so I'm a big fan of bad movies, as I know you are as well, Dave. That's one of our things we've been friends on, uh, is watching movies that we know are terrible, but they're hilariously terrible. Um, and uh, when people try to do that on purpose, it almost never works. I don't. I'm, someone might find an example out there, but I can't. The ones I can think of that are well known do not work. You know, you can't create the room on purpose. Um, there has to be a sort of underlying sincerity driving the madness. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's ultimately the real problem he ran into with this book is it is precisely that. Like at a certain point. Um, you know, it's hard to say because it, it, on one level, I think a lot of what he does is really valuable for the overall purpose. I mean, the, the way that it is so blunt and on the nose with all the imagery of the Nazi imaginary, even down to the guy's name, Farrick Jaeger, like, yeah. Farrick, I'm thinking iron. I'm sure that's what he's trying to get at, right? Ferris for the, the Latin for iron, and then Jaeger, hunter in German. Like, it's just the most absurd, like, 
um, 80s not, action movie. I, Iron Hunter, you know, like, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, it, it, and one of the things I thought that helped save it for me was reading it more as like, this is the Nazi imaginary made real, like all the points throughout are kind of like what I would think Hitler would have wanted his life to be or how he would have seen himself in that life that he actually lived. So many of the beats in the story are exactly the story are, are parallel to things out of Hitler's actual biography, but painted in the terms of his kind of, um, you know, uh, that he saw the world and his sort of heroic understanding of himself and of like the racial purpose of the Germanic people. Um, but on the other hand, that boy, that gets old real fast because because fascist aesthetics, I mean, there, there's a certain appeal to them, but they are also deeply corny and unsubtle and blunt. And this novel is all of that in, uh, in spades, just right. constant, the constant racial will and courage that they feel driving through them. And it's one of those books where, um, which you see a lot in sword and sorcery, we also seen a lot of melodrama and other stuff where the good guys are all handsome and strong and, and have a, their, their will is visible on them. Even the ones who are overweight are, you know, you can see that they have real power and vigor to them. Was the one um, bopping the older soldier who's one of the early supporters who's, they keep mentioning his fat and out of shape, but that he's still like, he's a, he's a strong man of strong will who knows what needs to be done, you know, and then all the villains are disgusting and inhuman and covered in pustules and, and vile and they make your stomach turn and they smell bad. And, you know, like, it's that kind of level of writing uh, that, boy, it gets old after a while. Like, I, on the other hand, it's 100% in keeping with, like, that fascistic worldview, right? Where the heroes are all perfect and clean and examples of what is good, and they're fighting absolute evil that must be destroyed. Um, great. But, I mean, boy, oh, boy, does that get boring after a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, just as writing, let alone separate from the ideology that's being expressed. And it's one thing to, um, I'm sorry, Mark, just real quick. It's one thing, you know, um, Dave mentioned that, you know, we bonded on bad movies. I, I love a bad movie. Um, I know Anthony is into it too. Um, but the thing about a bad movie is it's two hours. <laughs> There's that too, yeah, yeah. And then you can watch something good afterwards <laughs> or later. Right. But, yeah, but but I'm certainly on board with what Dave was saying that you you can't just set out to make a bad movie. That's something I'm constantly arguing about with people is that you don't just set out and go, I'm going to make a cult movie. A cult movie is not decided when you set out to make it. It, it mm-hmm. becomes a cult movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Commando is a fucking hilarious <laughs> movie. Yeah, exactly. They <laughs> wanted to make a great movie. They wanted well, I mean, that's- why I also brought up The Room, which is just the worst melodrama ever made, and it's amazing. Everything it's everyone does in that movie at every moment is the wrong thing. It, none of it makes sense. Only an absolute maniac could have made that movie. Um, like, it's hard to imagine someone doing something like that on purpose. If nothing else, you would not put two incredibly unsexy, incredibly long sex scenes in the first 20 minutes. Um, right? Like, the, who would have thought to do that if they were trying to make this parody of a romantic melodrama, right? Well, like, it's a certain kind of madness and wrong choices that are made by someone who's sincerely trying to do it right. One of um, the things that... that if you're buff yeah. of the room, if you're buff of the room, look up the Harper's Magazine article about it, mm-hmm. uh, which was published a few years ago, was where I first heard of it and was inspired to uh, buy the DVD. Uh, oh, yeah. It's, it's fascinating to hear Tommy Wiseau's cluelessness described at various levels and his ego oh, yeah. and his conviction that he had produced a dramatic masterpiece and then exactly. when the audiences start laughing at it his resourcefulness is saying okay if people find it funny i'll market it as a comedy but mm. getting back to the point i wanted to make earlier one of the things i loved about the iron dream was spinrad's artful way of putting elements of hitler's actual history and refracting them through this mythic mm-hmm. uh, version of his character. Yeah. And I could well imagine uh, the Iron Dream as the fantasy image, not only as, of Spinrad's Hitler, you know, 
working probably in a really tiny apartment, whipping out a science fiction novel in six weeks, and the real Hitler, mm -hmm. uh, seeing himself as this blonde, strapping, blue-eyed Superman, which is not what he looked like at all, uh, and uh, <laughs> you know, conquering, conquering and purifying the world out of the you know, pure expression of the German racial will. So um, the only problem with that is that uh, to keep the parallel with the real Hitler, uh, Spinrad had to have Stag Stopa betray Fuhrkiger, yeah. and that doesn't work on any level. You know, we, we just don't yeah. understand how did this happen? How did, you know, how did the man who was so sworn to loyalty that he literally kissed the magic weapon uh, then mm -hmm. turn against him three chapters later? Yeah. And with no, no setup, no anything. Although, obviously, like, that's, again, getting at, I think, some of the banality of fascist aesthetics, honestly. And also, like, I, I also have to say one of the things I think it does well, but maybe isn't clear, and I think the Whipple essay hints at, but I think, to me, seemed really obvious, is how much the description of the villains is exactly how the Nazis saw the world, right? Like, Zind as the USSR, you know, the, the Nazi ideology, it's one of the things that people who study far-right and you know, racist far-right movements have pointed out that um, part of why anti-Semitism is so central in a stated ideology is because they have to have an explanation for why inferior people are a challenge against their superior race. And so Jewish manipulation behind the scenes is always, always, always what they turn to. Um, and so the whole idea, of, and so like the Nazis used to refer to like Judeo-Bolshevism, right? that the Bolsheviks were a Jewish plot that threatened the world. And um, so having Zind be this empire of subhuman beings dominated by the ultimate evil of the Dom, like that is such a clear statement of like the Nazi idea of Judeo-Bolshevism. Um, I think the novel actually does a lot of that stuff like surprisingly well. Like there's a, it's a, but I, that's the other thing is that almost be, might be stuff that's too subtle. Like, as much as the rest of it is unsettled as all hell, there's, like, unless you, and I don't blame you if you haven't, unless you've sort of paid attention to fascist ideologies and especially Nazi ideology and white supremacist stuff, that's not necessarily going to be clear. Um, and, again, the corruption of stuff uh, that way fits. Um, but you're right. It's also, like, there's no setup for why there'd be a Night of the Long Knives in this novel like there was in real life. Right? It just happens. Well, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting, too, because for me, one of the things that, that kind of came up in my thinking on this was um, and when, when you're saying that you have to have kind of a sin sincerity to make something bad and make it work, is I do think that, and I don't know how everybody else read it, but um, I really did try to imagine... Hitler writing this when I was reading it. I tried not to think about Spinrad at all. Mm -hmm. I tried to think about this fake Hitler, and I tried to think about his life every time. I tried to imagine him sitting down at the typewriter and writing this. And I and 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 obviously Spinrad from that quote we were saying where he read all this stuff, he had to do that too. And so I do think that there's a degree that if he's getting into character, if he's being yeah. a met method actor about this. <clears throat> there is a certain bit about that. And I'm sure there's times where he was laughing like, oh my God, this is so ridiculous when mm -hmm. I'm doing this. But he had to kind of take it seriously in a method way when he was writing it, I'm sure. And that's an interesting experiment to think about on the writing wise of this. And one of the things that's genius about the Iron Dream is that, you know, it has all those politics that you're talking about. It has all that history. And then it has the satire and only somebody who is steeped in the genre and writing the genre and wanting to critique it, but also knew was smart enough to know the history and to research it. Um, I don't know who else could have written this book, but Norman Spinrad in that regard. I don't know if anybody else would be crazy enough or want to, because it, it's funny because a lot of the reaction when when because it took um, Spinrad years to find a publisher for Osama the Gun, and he was constantly on his blog or on Facebook telling people like, "Hey, I wrote this book, Osama the Gun, and nobody will publish it." 
And a lot of people's reaction in the genre was, here goes Spinrad again, we're not doing another Iron Dream. Right? <laughs> you know? And um, it took, he had to publish it in France first and get some good reviews over there before Wildside Press did it over here. And I think it's interesting to see that, you know, what Spinrad is doing is trying to, in this particular book, he's holding a mirror up, not just to history, but to the genre and using speculative fiction to, to explore fascism. And it is really interesting what he's saying about. And I think he hits a, a key point about the sort of, the imaginary and the aesthetic of fascism and that appeal that which he puts in the Whipple essay is all in sort of pseudo Freudian psychology. But I think you could think about it that for me uh, coming out of like having worked in cultural history and cultural studies is more like sort of the, the cultural imaginary. Um, I think he really hits on something by pointing out the, the concept of heroism and its centrality to that. Which leads to um, this. I'm going to, um, um, I admit a lot of it went over my head, you know, while reading it and researching it. It's one of those books where it's a, it's smarter than you're, than most people are going to understand while they're looking at it. You're just not going to get most of it. And uh, at some point, Spinrad was probably just thinking, I don't give a shit if they don't get it all. I know what I'm trying to say, and that's fine. <laughs> and um, but it's interesting the idea that he wrote a satire with um, absolutely very little humor <laughs> to none, mm -hmm. right? Well, I mean, the humor would be you laughing at just like Fair Jaeger cutting twenty people in half with one swing of a club, and you're just, what the hell does that even mean? Like some of those battle descriptions are just absurd. It's dead alive, but with a Nazi. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And That's that was true. one of the things that struck me is that the military technology is this sort of mishmash mm -hmm. of, you know, hand to hand combat that's more in line with the quasi medieval um, worlds of most sword and sorcery stories with the military technology that actually existed uh, and was available to Hitler, the real Hitler during World War II. Indeed, uh, one of my notes was that. The Iron Dream counts as a steampunk novel because uh, hmm. the beginning Hel Heldon is relying mostly on steam technology. If you want electricity in your home, you have to buy your own steam power generator to supply it. And, uh, you know, it counts as steampunk as well as a lot of other things. Well, and, and the technology has no consistency in this book. <laughs> like, it goes up and down. Hmm. There's planes, there's clubs, there's something, you know, it's <laughs> like... They go from burning wood to run a steam-powered bus system to having nuclear weapons and fighter jets. And and um, and space Nazis at the end, which... Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> which I would imagine... I would imagine about the space Nazis that that was Spinrad tipping his hat at Man in the High Castle. Because mm -hmm. even though the... the the TV show ignored this. Um, there are space Nazis going to Mars in the actual novel Man in the High Castle. Um, there's a lot of talk about how we got to send the Nazis to Mars. And like, I think that that whole scene was a tip of the hat to, uh, to his boy, Phil and the teacup. Um, <laughs> but uh, I could be wrong. Um, but that seems to me that that's going on. Um, did you guys see the Ursula Le Guin review of, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and I thought that was great, and I, I'm going to read this quote from it. Taken as a parody of sword and sorcery, the book hits all the targets. There is the hero, the alpha male with his muscles and, of steel, his clear eyes, and his manifest destiny. There's, there, there are the hero's friends. There are vile subhuman enemies. There's the hero's sword in the case of the trunk. Um, of yeah, truncation of interesting construction. There are tests, quests, battles, victories culminating in a final super victory of the Superman, which is also making, uh, I think, note of or uh, satirizing the uh, John W. Campbell as well. 
Um, back to the quote. There are no women at all, no dirty mm -hmm. words, no sex of any kind. The book is a flawless example of clean obscenity. God, what a great phrase. <laughs> it will pass any censor except the one that sits within the soul. Which is a great quote uh, from Ursula Le Guin. Uh, Although I mentioned, uh, when uh, I read that, I was struck by her commenting that the book was too long, which makes it ironic that Norman Spinrad originally had it shorter and was told by his publisher to lengthen it. Right. That, um, you, know, you know, a lot of the people who said it was too long, he might have agreed with that. But yeah. um, anyway, the part that Le Guin said that it would have worked better as a short story than a novel because a novel, you know, you know, that, that it was, uh, you know, that there wasn't really enough content for a full novel. And I read that to my husband, Charles, and he said, well, that's what a lot of people say about her stuff, too. <laughs> um, that's true. A lot of people do say that. Unfortunately, I think they are wrong because I think Ursula Le Guin is great um, and one of the best. But, uh, but yes, there is that uh, out there. Um, I do think well, that the you know the reaction to the novel um it was funny because i think um i do think it rewards you for knowing the history of mm -hmm. of the actual life and that's why i think before i read osama and uh, osama the gun i'm gonna i'm gonna do a deep dive on on a little osama <laughs> osama bin laden history before i go into those yeah, yeah um because I think that it'll it'll make for a better experience, but um, and you know I you know we all lived through that, so there's a degree that maybe we'll we'll remember a little bit more of that about that. But I do think that, for example, you know I think Mark and Dave, like you guys, got a little bit more out of the novel because you know more of the history of that era um, than probably Anthony and I did. Um, but at the same time, like. Um, you know, I, I just, I'm so impressed by, um, the commitment to the satire, uh, to, mm -hmm. is, is pretty impressive. Um, that's one of the things yeah. I think, whether I appreciate it or not, that the commitment to, to the satire is pretty hilarious. And by the way, on this first edition, there are these quotes on the back, if you're watching on the video, mm -hmm. um, from, and, and Moorcock, basically, it's like the Homer Whipple, but there's this supposed quote from Michael Moorcock. To compare this novel to the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, G.K. Uh, Chesterton, and Sir Oswald Mosley is not, I feel, saying too much. This exciting, intense fantasy adventure is the very quintessential of sword and sorcery. It is bound to earn Hitler the credit he so richly deserves. <laughs> I mean, so also that that choice of uh, authors is so brilliant. Like, um, I mean, it's one of those things. Again, you'd have to know who all of them are, but like, he basically just sort of picked a random assortment of react assortment of reactionaries. Some of whom did fantasy. Mosley wasn't even much of a writer. Obviously, he's a British fascist politician. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I think that's a that, that's another one of those things where like, if you understand that quote, then you probably understand what the novel's trying to do. Yeah, and I don't know who uh, Sir Oswald Mosley was, so maybe... Look, <laughs> actually, Look, Look, Dave, there's some great stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the most was, famous... No, oh, sorry, go ahead. Right, he was a British politician who in the 1930s actually organized a fascist movement in the UK called the British Union of Fascists. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got exactly nowhere, but he wasn't... Uh, I don't think he was seriously prosecuted either. He might have done some no. time after the war. Uh, but, um, you know, he was basically treated as one of Britain's uh, funny eccentrics who had this weird idea about, uh, you know, want, wanting a fascist uh, takeover of the UK and uh, wanting uh, uh, Britain allied with Germany, which was interesting because Hitler wanted Britain allied with Germany because mm -hmm. he thought the British and the Germans were the two halves of the Aryan master race. And in fact, he, uh, in 1942, Hitler supposedly sent a delegation to Bermuda 
to meet with the Duke of Windsor, the former Edward VIII, to see if he would be interested in becoming the puppet monarch of a German-occupied Britain. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of British aristocrats who were sympathetic to fascism back in the day. And the other thing about Mosley is he actually tried organizing post-war. Uh, fun story, just look up some of the stories out of that where um, it was Jewish anti-fascists who basically like crushed his movement um, in the streets. But so, so let's think about this for a minute. If that's who Sir Oswald Mosley was, and talk about shots fired compared <laughs> to Lewis and J.R.L. Tolkien. And G.K. Chesterton. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's, yep. And I presumed, and that originally back cover, in that original back cover, I presumed that uh, the blurbs that uh, Spinrad attributed to Moorcock, Harrison, etc., were actually by them, that he uh, outlined his concept to them and uh, asked them to blurb his fictitious book. Right, and so there's also Philip Jose Farmer, Harlan Ellison, and Harry Harrison on here. Ellison said, disturbingly fascinating. The stunned reader can only gasp in wonder. He took less of a risk there. Yeah. Uh, Phil Jose Farmer is... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Dave, that just made me think of... Uh, that could be an apt description of the reaction to the play and the producer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they the crowd just... <laughs> well, in a weird way, this, this shares... Um, uh, oh, this is very much like, yeah. The producers, yeah. Um, and then Phil Jose Farmer's quote is, Hitler's fierce belief in his parallel universe overpowers your sense of credibility and transports you into the very heart of horror. And this is the best part. This book should give him the kind of immortality he deserves. (laughs) Um, Which is pretty, pretty funny. Um, Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, the shots fired against the other writers is, is, it's pretty serious. Um, and it's funny because if you, it was very trendy when the Lord of the Rings trilogy was out to talk about Tolkien's history in the war and how, you know, it was this big analogy for anti fascism, right? Or that he was mm-hmm. fighting in the war. And so it's so funny to see Spinrad taking a, a big middle finger in the, in the other way. Um, I wonder where, where Mark and Dave, with your intense history of the time period, where do you think that is the truth somewhere in between starting with Dave? So, okay. Well, first of all, there's a lot to be, a lot of this is going to be down to Tolkien biography, which I'm not going to know that well, but it's my understanding. He was a relatively conservative guy who's, um, the type of story he told in the Lord of the Rings really clearly reflects a lot of the understandings about race and empire that sort of underlied the world he lived in. Um, and so when people point out that it's, you know, the folks in the West and the North fighting off, you know, an evil force from the East, who's got his hordes of, you know, throngs that he, or, you know, that he's brought from the East and South, like, it, I think there's something to that. Right. And, and I think another point, which if we're going to get deeper into this, I guess, is people have pointed out how Adolf Hitler explicitly, um, explicitly said that he was inspired by Westerns and by the American expansion under Manifest Destiny and that kind of thing. And in particular said that in the Eastern Europe, he wanted to imitate what the U.S. had done west of the Mississippi is one of the phrases that's been out there. And, um, what I'm getting at is I think it's more that both Hitler and Tolkien and a lot of other writers and thinkers of that era, were all drawing from a lot of understandings about um, especially Western white powers and their politics and about racial orders and who would be expected to be in charge of things and who not, where threats to civilization would come from, where civilization is seated and where it isn't. So I think that that's sort of getting at a point. I don't know about Tolkien being sympathetic with fascism. I mean, that's something else. 
But I think that there is a point there in saying that Tolkien is very much, he's probably the, one of the best examples. He's certainly one of the most famous drawing on precisely those kind of tropes, right? And then everybody imitated since sort of unthinkingly. And it keeps setting up this idea of, you know, sort of a good civilization versus evil. Um, and, you know, and again, sort of came up earlier in talking about Mosley and some of his sympathizers. People have also pointed this out about all kinds of conservatives in England. They weren't necessarily unsympathetic with fascism, especially as an opponent, you know, as opposed to communism. Um, there's one argument out there, which I'll leave it to better scholars than I who know this stuff more than me, that, you know, Churchill's main problem was the fascists in Europe, and he fought violently, right? But his main problem with them was really more about British nationalism and, and, and power, right? The Nazis were a threat. It wasn't necessarily an opposition to fascism or Nazism per se, right? It's more about geopolitics and the power of his home country and his sort of, you know, nationalistic um, feeling. Um, and so I think there's something to getting at that with the Tolkien one. It's, it, it is, it might be unfair to say that Tolkien sympathizes with Nazism. It isn't to compare the underlying tropes that Tolkien drew upon to those that also are present in sort of Nazi ideology, Nazi imaginary. And again, I think Spin read that really well. I think that's like the key point, and I think he does it well in the novel, even if he kind of belabors the point. Mark, uh, how do you feel about the shot fired at, at Tolkien? Oh, uh, well, I'm not a big Tolkien fan. I never made it through The Lord of the Rings, so uh, I'm kind of uh, back of scratch. I do remember that in the 1960s, there was a rumor, and it actually got printed as fact in at least one article, that Tolkien had actually been commissioned by the British Secret Service to write an answer myth to Wagner's Ring of the Nibelung, which was uh, something the Nazis and Hitler in particular were big fans of, and um, that uh, there are um, you know, obvious similarities in, you know, down to the very structure of the Lord of the Rings, a relatively short prologue followed by three very long main parts. And, you know, Tolkien himself always said, it's just a fantasy. It has no broader meaning than that. But I've never been able to believe that a man who was living in a small country, fighting for its life in a world war against an enemy led by a genocidal egomaniac could have been just a fantasy rather than reflecting Tolkien's real life living in a small country, fighting a world war against an enemy led by a genocide of the So, um, you know, I can, I can see, I can see both ways of it. I can see why Norman Spinrad regarded Tolkien as part of the, um, ideology was, uh, you know, as part of the literary style he was ridiculing. And in particular, why he appropriated Tolkien's title for the Lord of the Swastika. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it definitely, you know, I think the more you look at this first edition, the shots fired are a little bit more hardcore than in the later, the later editions, especially once they got to the Bantam edition with the goofy motorcycle Hitler, um, scooter Hitler, uh, uh -huh. covers, um, some of the bite, of the initial um, editions were were not there, and and you know it's um, it's funny because in um, I think about there have been times in in punk rock history where um, bands were formed to basically make a political message against other bands and would play shows and specifically yell at those other bands and and make a big scene and and what I really love about one of the things I love about the Iron Dream is that it's, it's, it's a spin ride. It's a huge, this book is a huge middle finger <laughs> to um, stalwarts in, in, in the community. And in, in, in that regard, you know what I'm saying? So I guess what I'm saying is that um, I think the, the thing of the book is more important than the actual text. And that is very rare for me. There are very few books that I would say you, you can get away with the book being a shitty book because of the point you were trying to make. Um, 
Because there are certainly novels that I've read where I liked the idea behind it, but the execution was terrible, and that still I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give it a pass. But in the case of the Iron Dream, I think I, I think I am. So in that regard, that's, that's at least in part because Spinrad is deliberately writing it terribly. Yeah. He's trying to get into the headspace of the failed, frustrated Hitler who fled his. Uh, homeland and came to the U.S. and eked out this weird living uh, and had delusions of grandeur, delusions of running an entire country, of conquering the world, of eliminating all the inferior races, blah, 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 uh, that the real Hitler actually came uh, all too close to achieving, even though he was ultimately defeated. Um, That, you know, I think, you know, I think... This is the pattern, that, the point that Le Guin made in her article that, uh, you know, you read all this stuff and then you're, you've constantly got the uh, whole premise of the book tapping you on the shoulder and saying, this is not Norman Spinrad saying this. This is Adolf Hitler saying this. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, you know, Hitler in the context of a science fiction novel expressing the horrible things the real Adolf Hitler believed in and tried to accomplish. And, um, you know, that if you like this sort of literature, you have to recognize that, you know, you're liking in a lot of respects the similar world dream to what the real Hitler had and tried to fulfill in his real power. Well, and I think if you take the most mainstream of science fiction that you can, take Star Wars, for example, um, you know, and then I, I know George Lucas gets hammered for the prequels and the prequels have a lot of things that are wrong with it but one of the things that is cool about the prequels is that the republic are the bad guys pretty much of the prequels that they descend into fascism and they allow themselves to be taken over and i thought that that was a neat thing that lucas clumsily did um (laughs) you know in, in in the prequels but um you know I, I, I don't know. I mean, so, um, Dave, how do you feel overall about the reading experience of this? Um, no, I think I said ahead of time before we met, uh, this is a book that's really interesting to think and write, think and talk about, uh, less interesting to actually read. I would say, you mentioned the phrase unreadable. I wouldn't say that. It's more like it was just this white noise at a certain point. Right, it was just this wave of, of, you know, one victory to the next for Ferris Yeager, you know, and uh, it got really boring. And especially because there, I would also add, there's no real characters in this book at all. Like, the the closest you get is Ferris Yeager, and he is always right all the time, 100% certain. Everything is his iron will. We at least get to see how you know the inner thinking of him, but he's not a particularly deep man with a lot of uh, interesting things going for him. All of his friends, I mean, they're practically, you know, the, the, the inner circle and all his friends, with the exception of maybe, you know, Stropa, the leader of his stormtroopers. I had a hard time telling him apart, right? He had to constantly, the constant reminder that so-and-so headed this ministry and maybe like, you know, this one was fatter and this one had, you know, whatever. But at a certain point, I was losing track of even who those companions were and who was doing in charge of what, and that was ultimately the problem for me is it's just not good. Like, I mean, you know, a good novel has, you know, characters who have multiple dimensions to them and grow and change. And, you know, Farrah Yeager is a nobody at the beginning of the novel, but his thinking and the way he acts changes almost nothing throughout it. Other than the fact that he gets this mystical weapon that convinces everyone that he's the, the biggest, baddest dude ever, you know. Um, it, it, it should be noted that, Spin, for, for anyone who, if this is their first experience with Spinrad, is that Spinrad can write characters and he can write. Well, and and I, I, I wanted to say, that's the other thing is, I, I, I'm not necessarily my problem, sure, I personally, I'm not having my problem, my problems with this novel, I've got enough of Spinrad's reputation, even if I haven't read his other stuff, but I'm not attributing those to him being a bad writer necessarily. I do think a lot of this grows from the nature of the work he was doing. Um, it's hard to think, of, I, you know, again, I think it's actually totally in keeping with a lot of fascist aesthetics that there's going to be, you know, the most memorable stuff or him describing, you know, these incredibly elaborate rallies, 
right? They could come up with a hell of an interesting spectacle, but boy, these people are dull as dirt and all they care about is killing in their own supremacy. But, you know, it's in the name of saving humanity, so it's a good thing. Well, and, and speaking as people in 2020, a week away from Donald Trump resuming rallies where people have to sign a waiver saying they won't sue if they get coronavirus, <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, we're in the thick of, of seeing what, what the importance of rallies and, and, you know, the fascists. But, um, you know, I think the thing with Spinrad is that yeah, he was writing this Hitler, so a lot of this is, is um, you know, he's, he's writing these cardboard characters for a reason. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I definitely, um, you know, think that uh, the reading experience of it was definitely tough, and so that, that there, there is that going on. Um, Mark, uh, your, your feelings, was this your first time reading it, or was it a reread? Like I said, I'd read it originally in the 70s when it came out, and uh, I was interested in it because I had seen this videotape of an interview with Spinrad talking about it before it was published and explaining what he was doing, what he was up to. So maybe I had a little more uh, background in it than uh, some of the rest of you because uh, you know I'd already heard the author's own explanation of what this book was about and why it's written the way it is and why the characters don't have dimension and why, aside from the walk-on of the attendant on the road steamer uh, taking Yager from uh, Orgravia to uh, Heldon, uh, there aren't any women. Um, and it struck me, you know, since we've just mentioned Donald Trump, that there's, you know, that this book has become incredibly more relevant uh, in the Trump era and there's a particular uh, passage that Spinrad in Whipple Persona uh, writes at the end. Um, Ferrick Yegar is essentially a monster, a narcissistic psychopath with paranoid obsessions. The total self-assurance and certainty is based on a total lack of introspective self-knowledge. And, you know, aside from the fact that the Whipple part of the book is, among other things, a satire on the reverence with which Freud and his ideas about human development mm -hmm. in the human psyche were held in the 1950s. Uh, it's also, you know, that passage now leaps out at you as, you know, yeah, that's Trump. Well, and that, that quote goes on to say, and I think the rest of the quote is good too, he would be able to manipulate the surface of social reality by projecting his own pathologies upon it but he would be able to share in the inner communion of interpersonal relationships. Such a creature could give a nation the iron leadership and sense of certainty to face a moral crisis, but at what cost? Led by the likes of Frederick Yeager, we might gain the world at the cost of our souls. Um, I mean, well, and I think that um, Hitler had more leadership skills than Donald Trump, but um, you know, so he was able to accomplish a bit more, um, you know, in that sense. But, but uh, that quote, I think, is the, you know, it wraps up the book. So, yeah, I had that same quote <laughs> in my notes, too. And uh, I think it, it does come down to that. Um, uh, so, Anthony, tell me about your experience in reading this. I think I would have preferred this to be a 90 minute outlandish exploitation movie is what Ooh. I would rather have seen this as only so I could see this scene realized hot on the heels of the motorcycle SS came a formation of 200 black and scarlet tanks moving at speed and ranks of 10, you know? So I going back to kind of what I was saying earlier and what David touched on or Dave, I have to differentiate the Davids now. Um, it's, uh, I don't think it needs to be as long as it is to get the point of the experiment across. I think yeah. it, I think it could have, like I said, it could have been a novella or even just a, a long ish short story with still the same kind of sat satire of Hitler. Um, but I, I think even writing through the lens of Hitler, Spinrad still, great with words. He's still a stylist when it comes to language. 
Um, so that helped me a little bit, not hate it completely, but there were a lot of times where I would start skimming and then go back and reread it and go, nope, it's still just a bunch of just, you know, we go from I'm here to we're conquering this. Now we're Mm -hmm. at camps. Now there's more gore, more gore. Here's a four page analyst and, and and now analysis of it. And I just found myself wanting a different book altogether, or at least a different structured book. Yeah. um, There's also the scene on, um, page 226 of the rediscovery edition where the motorcycles and tanks form an enormous swastika (laughs) around the burning city. (laughs) Yeah. Ridiculous. And, um, yeah. And, uh, that was was one of the funny parts. I do love some of the descriptions of the radiated jungles because this is a post nuclear society. too. Yeah. And and that's what I'm saying. Spinner adds, ability as a writer is incredible because before this I'd recently read men in the jungle, which is phenomenal. And so it's a slog and I don't think it needs to be this long. That's my opinion. Well, and I understand that. And I understand that point of view, but I think the reason why he would not have done it as a short story or a novella is the message would have been lost if it was just a short story in a collection it wouldn't have the uh, the quotes on the back cover and and like the imagery of it and and I think that part of the social experiment and the artistic um, middle would it be though because there is no arc there's no character arc really and there aren't any real stakes it's like Avengers stakes no one actually dies no like no one of the main cast can actually really die they accomplish everything they set out to do. So there's no real stakes. There's no character arc. Why couldn't it be shorter? I'd like to answer Anthony's question. Yes. Um, that I, you know, while I'd like to see Norman Spinrad's earlier version without the extra 10,000 words he added at the behest, added to the behest of his publisher, uh, I think it does need to be a full length novel because of, uh, if he'd written it as a short story, you would not be presented with the whole text of the Lord of the Swastika. You would simply be quoting mm-hmm. from it. And somehow I think that, you know, however hard it gets to read at some points, and it is. Uh, the, cumulative, the cumulative power of the book really comes precisely from its repetitiveness, from its deliberate weaknesses as a novel, from its lack of character growth and development. The man of destiny just, you know, overcomes and one awareness or another and slaughter or, 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 people who are in his way. Um, I think it, you know, it gains a certain degree of power from uh, it being the length it is, though I suspect that uh, if we had Spinrad's original version without the padding, uh, it would be even better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. I can if, agree with that. that. Editor was like, "We need more flaming swastika tanks." Uh, <laughs> you know. I mean, I honestly wonder if that isn't the stuff though that would have been in the earlier one, and it's more like we need more action and adventure, and that's why you just get endless rounds of these battles that I mean ab- just jack shit. Like, just everything happens and nothing happens in them. Yeah. Uh, although, honestly, I think it, the the point you're just making, I think, is is great. Like, there's something to the constant evocation of massive spectacle and of heroism in the context of it being so fucking banal and boring. Uh, and I think that actually hits something really like important also about both the work he's critiquing and about sort of fascist aesthetic. Yeah. Um, and again, that's part of why I say like as much as I didn't enjoy reading it, I don't hold it against spin because I, I think that's the point. Yeah. Well, and I think this is the kind of book where it's like, um, if somebody asks me if it's good or not, I'm going to tell them, well, it makes a really good point, but you don't necessarily have to read it. Let, let us do that for you. <laughs> you know? Because you're going to get as much out of reading Le Guin's essay about it or listening mm-hmm. to the podcast, you know. To yeah, enjoy. although I'm the kind of person who, like, I'd read that Le Guin essay and be like, I kind of got to see this for myself. Yeah, I could see that. You know? and, and I don't totally disagree with you. I just, uh, I think there's a certain point where, um, where I think that 
Spinrad is somewhat working at a level that most people reading this are, are, are just going to, it's, it's going to go right over your head. And, and that's fine. Sometimes, you know, um, you know, I think a lot of times with the books that we do, even with PKD, like, um, you know, a lot of times I like the book more when I read about it later because I start to catch things that I didn't catch, you know, when I was reading it. And then it, you know, gives me more depth. Uh, one of those books was, even though it was a total fucking mess, uh, Lies Inc. Um, there were, there were certain aspects of that book, for example, that, that once we were discussing it on the podcast, you know, it, it, it went up in my estimation and Anthony knows it didn't that you're notorious for doing that. Yes. Yes. Well, and, um, there was one time where it went the opposite way and that's with cosmic puppets that I hated cosmic puppets when I read it. And I hated it even more, the more we talked about it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think with the iron dream, I think there's, there's really cool stuff to, to say about it. So on that note, uh, any final thoughts starting with, uh, my boy F and Dave Woken. Uh, I don't know if I have any left. I think I hit most of the main ones. Um, I've wanted to so far. Uh, and like I said, I, as much as I said, I didn't enjoy reading this. I actually think it, it makes a really interesting and important point. And I think his ultimate, it's interesting also reading it now. I mean, one of the essays you found was written in, I'm going to say 2014 and was talking about how relevant this is even now with some of the cultural politics and the science fiction scenes. And I think he also, there's really something to the way that it's, uh, you know, he put it in psychology terms, and we didn't even get into the whole political, economic, institutional versus psychological, you know, explanations for fascism. But he really nails, like, that cultural imaginary and its importance. I mean, the, the, the later goofy covers that have Hitler riding a motorcycle, um, or the, even the imagery in the novel itself, it also made me think of, you know, something close to my heart, heavy metal music, punk rock, uh, a lot of which drew on biker culture, a lot of which relied heavily on fascist aesthetics. Also things like the electronica world, right? Bands like Joy Division and New Order. Again, not far writers or anything, but with a really similar kind of aesthetic. And there's also our fascist and electronic music, right? Um, and I think he's getting at something there, even if he's talking specifically about science fiction, about the sort of appeal of fascist aesthetics and the role that it plays ideologically. Um, yeah, it's a very smart novel, but not particularly fun to read. Um, uh, final thoughts, Anthony. Um, I think that it is an important book, regardless of how kind of bored I was through it. Uh, Mark made a good point that the constant hammering of the same kind of themes over and over again, adding to the spectacle of it really does change my perspective on the book a little bit because good satire does point out how asinine the topic it is satirizing can be. So I, I would recommend this book to anyone that is willing to engage with what the text is trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the hard part because it's, yeah. it, it, it's a satire that's, you're not, it's, you're not going to be laughing the whole time, you know, and a satire that doesn't. No. And tough. there are cringy moments in this book. Oh yeah, uh, quite a few. Um, all right, Mark, you're the reason we did this episode. You were very insistent that we not wait around to do it. Um, close us out with final thoughts on the Iron Dream. Well, um, I think uh, it's I think it's a marvelous book. I loved it when it first came out. Um, I could see reading it this time around that the repetitiveness of the battle scenes and all the, you know, all the sheer gore, all the, you know, details, the uh, purpose-bred warriors of the Doms uh, deliberately pissing and shitting on each other once their dominator controllers are killed and they have no will of their own. Um, I could see why uh, some people would regard this as a slog. I guess I came to it with several advantages, having heard Norman Spinrad explained the concept even before it was published, uh, and having uh, read a lot of stuff about Hitler and the Nazis, recognizing the historical illusions. And I would simply leave uh, uh, my fellow podcasters with uh, 
Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, the good bad movie about the Nazis. Looks like they lost Mark. Although, yeah, Triumph of the Will is something I thought of with all those rally scenes. And I'm sure that's what Spin Rand was trying to do. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, uh, we got almost to the end with Mark. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess uh, to, to, to just wrap things up, uh, finally, I would say um, continue to, for our listeners, to continue to check out Spin Rad. All right, let's close shop and just remember, uh, dickheads, keep it paranoid. Stay Later. Paranoid.